Mike from Strike will get started here really quickly. Um, quick introduction, I'm Austin Ganyu, Senior Solutions Engineer in the Northeast for Server and Mobile. And this is Matt Engines Ron. I'm a uh, Senior Director in Catchbase Engineering, mainly focused on things like developer platforms, but uh, cut across a lot of different parts of the system. All right. Uh, so today we're here to talk about uh, high availability, in this case, ultra high availability. Couchbase as a platform is already really available. We have a lot of features built in, um, a lot of automation of those features. So being able to keep things running is kind of the name of the game for us. We just talked about cloud a little bit ago. Automation is part of that whole thing. But also is being able to uh, keep your connections you know, and your applications working uh, as best as possible, right? With as limited interaction as uh, from a person as you can have. Uh, that goes to the high availability part. That's an intrinsic nature of the couch-based data platform. Uh, and then disaster recovery, right? How do we sort of handle that? What are the features in Couchbase that can allow you to accommodate for that? And then, of course, um, one of the new features in 5.0, and we're going to talk about fast failover. Uh, in the past, you know, you might wait 20, 30 seconds, a, a minute, maybe two minutes. Depends on your configuration requirement. You can still set some of those things today, but we wanted to get a little bit closer to more real time, right? So when something fails, in, in cloud, especially with like a microservices architecture or something, you really don't want to wait minutes, right? Or large numbers of seconds. And then we'll finish up with the building the high availability application. So in Couchbase Server, um, I want to just highlight the first part, which is single node architecture. Uh, the fact that we have, uh, you know, the cluster manager out there, he enables everybody to talk from an application perspective to the Couchbase cluster, no matter how many nodes you have, and you get one sort of picture of the cluster. Not quite single system image, if you're familiar with that terminology from a long time ago, when we're talking about one command line, 100 servers, like that, that was the way things used to be. This is similar to that with one intelligent connection spanning out to all of the nodes, right? So now, if something fails, I kind of know what's going on. But because we have a single node type, we install one software package that can do many different kinds of things you have that immutable cluster manager as the primary thing that you're going to talk to. And then, of course, you choose what services to deploy. And that was kind of the premise of the last one for those of you that were here. Uh, otherwise, just so you know, you need some storage. We have a managed cache built in whenever you're talking to data, right? And then search, query, index, and data specifically are the services that you want the nodes to be. For any of the services listed, though, you know, beyond the managed cache, right? We're just talking about those uh, uh, light blue down to the red. Those are the main services as a checkbox, right, that you would actually choose. And here we've got just a two-node cluster, but you can see that when we're going to be highly available, there's other things happening that's going on in there. And one of the things that's really important from a, either a data perspective, which is where we're talking about replication right now, right, memory-to-memory -memory replication. I, I can have a number of copies of the data for HA capability. That's within a cluster. Uh, that's about redundancy, right, just being... Uh, able to store the data if something were to fail. I want to make sure that data is going to be available in the next n seconds for the application to continue to read and write, right? Being re resilient <coughs> against failure. And of course, we say bandwidth optimized. That's because we're only sending the data that has changed. So that way we're not spamming the network and that sort of thing uh, for replica updates, for instance. And then one of the other features in Couchbase is this thing known as Rack Zone Awareness. Because a lot of folks uh, that are Couchbase customers already run in the cloud, uh, the ability to run one cluster across multiple availability zones is possible if the latency is low enough. Now, in order to accommodate that, because we have a sharding strategy, we have replicas, that kind of thing, we want to be able to take your data, your bucket, and divide it into these different availability zones for maximum availability, right? So I only need one cluster and I could go, in this case, like three nodes, uh, or six nodes rather, nine nodes rather, I can't count, uh, across all of the different availability zones. So you can see three in each, that's why we've got the red and the green and the blue, uh, you know, one, two, three, top to bottom. Rack one or availability zone one is in that group. And that's a logical thing that you would set up, but you can also do that programmatically. So if you're using a cloud template or something like that, or you, you have integrated deployment with your pipeline, you can pass in a REST command that says, hey, make nodes one, two, and three part of this group, right? And then what we will do with that is the other nodes and other groups will get replicas for each other. So that way, even with one set of replicas, 
you're fairly well protected across multiple node failures in an availability zone. So what does failover look like in action? One of the features that I was talking about earlier, being able to be aware something's happened, and now my application is processing data, a node has something wrong, whether it's the network that goes down or somebody's rebooted it, maybe they uh, undeployed something, God forbid, or uh, perhaps there's a bug in Kubernetes and it you know, randomly kills things or whatever. That should be fine. Your application should continue to march. And that's what's happening both at the Couchbase library side. And what you just saw was the replicas become active, OK? And that's just making sure that you have read-write availability of that data. Now, uh, what happens after that is the cluster map is updated to say, hey, everybody, you were reading and writing to this node also before, but he's gone now. I need you to get your data from these other nodes, right? And because we have these shards, because they're automatic, uh, the, uh, the raise of replica to active, right, that change in state is also managed by Couchbase when a failover event occurs, and then we update that cluster map automatically to let everybody see that this has happened. So the actual outage and downtime is pretty much non-existent or minimally felt, if even, uh, uh, during one of these events. Now, that would only be if you hit a timeout. That's when you actually might register. Otherwise, we automatically handle the retry, right? Which is very valuable from an application availability perspective. So taking that a little bit further into the capability of not only having a failover, but now I want to prevent against disaster. So let's say I have uh, my availability zones or whatever, but I still have another cluster somewhere else because maybe there's a really widespread East Coast network bug with Amazon. That has never happened in the past year, has it? <laughs> um, so, or, or a DDoS attack or a number of other things. You still want to be protected against those things, right? So if I can do that, why not replicate your data outside of the availability zones or the region, the physical region that you're in as well? And that's something that Couchbase Server has built into it called XDCR. It's a very simple to set up thing, also REST endpoint capable. I just simply define an IP address on the other cluster. And because of that cluster map that you saw before, we, we interpret the cluster map ourselves. I know it's a node. And that node behind that node is 10 other nodes. And because I see those 10 other nodes, now I can also handle anything that happens with rebalances or failures on the other clusters too, making sure that I don't have to really interact with the cross data center stuff too much. I'm going to keep it up and running. Uh, and as a highly available thing, that's great. But in this model, I still have to make my application aware that it should connect to this cluster or that cluster. So we've added some features we're going to talk about very shortly about how to sort of automate that without having to maybe even worry about the GSLB as much, right? Because you're still going to potentially want a global load balancer. I want to know I want to connect to east because I'm on the east, or I want to connect to west because I'm on the west. That might be my best latency. That's a matter of practicality for the application owner. But then beyond that, resiliency-wise, what do I do? So uh, a couple of quick features about XDCR, I've mentioned some of them already, but one of the things I want to mention is that applications can read and write from both clusters when you're using the active-active capability, right? Now, if you think of something like DataGuard or Golden Gate or DRBD or some other replication technology, it may not actually be the case. You may be reading and writing, but there's probably some latency in there, right, that you may want to sort of overcome through the application stack. With Couchbase, um, if I was to sort of blindly read and write from either location without worrying about latency, I might have to put some extra timing into my application reads and stuff like that too, okay, in the past. So now we have some additional capabilities. Uh, also filtering, I did want to mention that I put it in there in red. I wanted everybody's eyes to kind of go down there. Um, but, you know, the fact that you can push, make this a push button operation, it's now my data is in multiple places. And I don't have to have two locations. I can have multiple locations, right, with different data in different places, or all the data can be active, active. Uh, how many people have an iPhone? Just curious. Yeah, so a lot of us, right? Your application profile that you access all of your stuff through in iTunes is stored in Couchbase. It's stored in multiple clusters in Couchbase. And you don't always hit the same cluster because all the clusters have the exact same data via XDCR, right? They are replicated and they're aware. So therefore, if I'm here on the East Coast or I fly to California, I'm probably going to hit one on the West Coast, right? And the latency should be as good as it should be no matter where I'm at. I go to Europe, it works just the same way. 
So what does it look like? Oh, sorry, there's the animation there. My apologies. Go back again really quick. I will leave it alone now. All right. So what we're saying is XDCR after write from cache, right? And so why that's important is because we have the managed cache, all of your read and write activity comes from the cache first and last, right? I write the data to cache. It's committed, quote unquote, right? My operation is done unless I ask for additional durability. When I read the data, it's also coming from cache. Now that means that whenever I have these queuing operations like to another node for a replica copy within the cluster or XDCR outside of this cluster, it's also using the memory, right? So when we say XDCR after write, the latency on that write is as fast as memory. Right? And that's the important part to think about here. It's not like a disk queue. I'm not worrying about how many things are sitting there waiting, not a copy on write. Right? We're not talking about that kind of thing. We're talking about what's changed. We're going to coalesce as much of that together as possible, so we're only sending the pertinent change data out the wire from memory directly to the other nodes in the other cluster Right? in a multi-processed uh, 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 way. Right? So I have threads open to every single node in the other cluster too, from all the nodes in this cluster. And I'll send directly to wherever those shards would be for those documents. It's highly parallelized is the point. So what else can it do? We have conflict resolution in here, so you're not managing that so much. Uh, there are a couple of things, obviously. We only support two main methods, but conflict resolution based on revision. How many things have changed in what sequence? OK, great. But then there's the other part of it, which is time-based conflict resolution, which is newer, right? And the reason that that's most important is that gives you a much more true last write wins, right? I want to make sure that I failed over as a session between east and west, perhaps, right? That last write went to the west, and then I'm back on the east coast, and maybe it was cache data in a different sequence or something like that. Well, I want to know that when I actually wrote that, it should make it back from west to east and be in the right order, right? And so that last right wins is going to be really, really important to know that this was, in fact, the last piece of data that should have been. Otherwise, it might be an out-of-order delivery. And if that were the case with the first one, you could actually end up you know, uh, smacking a, a piece of data that you just wrote. So that's why last right wins is important for us. Um, use the hybrid logical clock, combination of physical and logical time. But there's a counter on every document write that we do, which is why the time and the counter is so important. That gives us a much more accurate, uh, gosh, I'd say within you know 0.99 percent, something like that, you know, like two significant digits, right? Something like varies that varies based on your latency, but basically based as close latency. as you can get. Yeah. Exactly, as close as we can get. Uh, and of course, latency is a factor, but we also try to overcome that with time, right? The fact that we know that is very significant. And then cross cluster failover and fail back. This is actually where we're gonna, you know. Be, get a little bit more in depth, but the fact that I do have another cluster over there that could fail, that's perfectly reasonable. East Coast goes down in Amazon for some reason. You can still read and write to your other cluster uh, you know, on the, on the West Coast. Like That's not a big deal for us. And then the data will also filter back. Because we have that conflict resolution built in, we're aware what's changed on either side, and we'll make sure the data gets where it needs to go. That is the only, if you'll hear me ever say the word, eventual consistency that is in our product because we can't control the speed of the WAN, and there may be events that cause data to update in one place before another, but it will become eventually consistent you know, within the latency of the WAN, okay? All right, and then uh, last but not least, when we talk about disaster, this is not a sexy subject, but it is something that we want you to know is available. The, the fact that you can actually do managed backups with Couchbase, we have the Couchbase, Couchbase Backup Manager is what we have today. If you're familiar with an older version of Couchbase, you, there might have been Couchbase Backup or CB Backup. Um, not very efficient at all, really. It did the job. It lets you back things up. This is a much more... Uh, 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 can't think of the word. It's a better approach. So if you think of like uh, uh, R-Man or something like that from some other products, right? Uh, SQL Backup. Incre uh, uh, holistic, I think. Holistic. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. To, to where we know what's been backed up. There are objects in there, and it, we're encompassing a methodology, right? And that's kind of the point here is that I, I know I have all this data. I know I may have failures in here, but because I can have differential and cumulative types of incremental backups and then merge them periodically, I basically can uh, create an incremental forever capability across the board. 
And that's a strategy that a lot of other enterprise databases have been using for a long time. All right. So that leads me to uh, fast failover. What does that look like? Uh, you know, in short, you can fa fail over in five seconds. Now, from a couch-based perspective, if you're not as familiar, uh, the lowest latency you could say uh, that an automatic failover would occur in was 30 seconds as of, you know, eight months ago, something like that. When 5.0 came out, we were able to lower it down to uh, right around the five-second time. I think it actually was closer to seven seconds, but now in, in 5.1 and that sort of thing, uh, it's just small improvements, right? But five seconds is reasonable uh, from a network flat perspective, especially when you're talking about 10 gigabit networks and things of that nature, when you're talking about microservices that need faster failover, when you're talking about things that are uh, maybe mobile enabled and that kind of thing, the time to delivery of those and recovery is extremely important. So being able to detect and recover within five seconds for that failover is what we're talking about, right? That's the time period that you should have to worry about how long is my data unavailable. Again, because we automatically retry within the SDKs and between nodes, you're, that's the longest time up technically that you're going to have to wait for. Um, in other versions of Couchbase, it's been much longer. You see the community edition is still at 30 seconds today. Uh, but if you go back a little bit further, it might even behoove you to do 60 or 90 seconds, depending on the cloud platform or the deployment methodology you used. So there's definitely reasons to uh, do that. And then uh, the failure detector, the reason that that's significant is that that's what enables that five second timeout for us. Used to be sort of a measurement of a lot of different metrics. Now we have a particular heartbeat methodology that we've developed for the speed of our product, which is the key to enable you to uh, be really consistent at that five second um, uh, failover. Um, I think that's the main, oh yeah, a little bit of a graphic that tells you what that looks like. And this is more describing the um, uh, failure detector and then what happens when a failure has been detected. So fairly quickly, you got your cluster manager, which is where we started with, uh, the data service monitor, what's happening for reads and writes. The node monitor kind of builds on that. And they share a status, right? This is something that's new. That didn't exist quite this way before. It all came out of the cluster manager before trying to coordinate everybody together, which is not a bad thing, and it had worked for us for a really long time. But it, it, when you have a lot of network flapping or something like that, it can cause some uh, inactivity with the cluster manager. We wanted to avoid that. We want to keep things really available from a cluster map perspective and all that great stuff. Uh, and then being able to figure out, is this the correct status? And then auto perform the auto failover. And so what we're actually looking at here uh, is almost like a marshaller, if you will, right? Being able to say, hey, everybody, this thing really happened. We're all in consensus. Now, you know, take an action. And that action is going to be to fail out a, a node that's having a problem or whatever. Uh, the reason that you're seeing that this way and not that failed node or whatever, because he's kind of out of the picture. These guys have to sort of figure it out together. But this process would occur in every node. It's not just a singular node. It's one node at one time whenever that event occurred. And then the next event might happen. It could be a different node. So all nodes really, truly are equal as well. All right. I'll go ahead and stop there for my piece of it and then let you uh, get to the highly available part. Sounds for good. the application side. Great. Right. Uh, you're thank mine. you, actually. I'm oh, you're mine. Give Austin a break here after... Uh... Two, two sessions in a row. So um, uh, thanks very much for uh, spending some time with me this morning. So as you may have seen when you were coming in the room, I didn't actually get to quite set everything up. So you're going to see a little bit of that live. But what I want to talk a little bit about is um, how does this uh, apply at the application layer? As Austin mentioned, in many cases, you're typically going to have that. Uh, you might have a pool of application servers in one of each of a set of data centers. So that means that, uh, say, for example, I have a global load balancer. I'm going to have a set of application servers accessing a cluster uh, in my East Coast data center and a set of application uh, servers accessing my data in a West Coast data center because everyone has an East Coast and West Coast data center, right? So the, uh, the, that's the way um, you generally will have things work. And it works well in, in, for many use cases. An example would be a user profile. If Austin's accessing his user profile from his iPhone, it's not uh, the kind of situation where he's, uh, you know, there's another copy of Austin on the West Coast accessing his same user profile. So you're really only updating those records in one location, and therefore we can kind of rely on timestamp-based uh, conflict uh, resolution. Uh, so that that's kind of your your, your traditional view is uh, from a single cluster. Um, 
What we've done, though, uh, is we've recently, uh, this is a new uh, feature as part of the uh, Enterprise Edition sub subscription. Uh, there are, uh, so it's, it, it's uh, layers on top of the existing uh, SDK. What we've done is we've created a multi-cluster aware SDK, uh, initially in Java. We're eventually going to roll that out to other platforms. I'd love to hear feedback on what platforms you'd like to he hear about from it. But what it really allows you to do is you can take that same application that you've already written and put it on top of the multi-cluster aware client that exposes the same uh, API, the same interface. Now, as abstractions uh, tend to work, just because it's the same interface doesn't mean that you won't necessarily notice any differences at all. You know, things like the timestamp-based conflict resolution underneath does have an effect on how uh, certain kinds of application uh, behavior work. Uh, but the great news is what it does is it allows you as an application developer or deployer to describe to the system what behavior you want to have in certain kinds of fault conditions. Uh, the most popular one, for example, is um, maybe I have a, an application where, which is, uh, needs to make sure writes get to a node in a cluster. In traditional uh, catchbase, uh, you might, even in a failover kind of situation, it may take a few seconds to be able to identify that node and fail over. So really, you just want to be able to write somewhere else. Maybe this is an IoT type application where the records you're receiving just need to be written somewhere. So with the multi-cluster aware client, you can kind of describe in that sort of fault situation, just go ahead and write to the equivalent vBucket in the alternate cluster. And that way, when the node in the local cluster becomes available again, that data would replicate back. And since you're talking about records that you're writing once and then reading maybe through an aggregation or something along those lines, you don't actually uh, see any impact in the application. Um, it also allows us to uh, do, uh, you as a, an application deployer, to do t traffic distribution. Maybe you have a maintenance uh, interval where you want to be able to take one particular data center offline, go through a hardware upgrade or some sort of uh, software upgrade. Through the multi-cluster aware uh, client, you can actually direct it. So in Java today, what we're doing is we allow you to do that either through JMX or programmatically. Uh, and so you can define how you want that application to switch over as opposed to failover between different data centers, um, which may happen from occasion. So uh, as an example, there we were using the, uh, the data center on the right. And if I were to switch over, it might switch over to, oops, wrong way. Uh, I can switch over to the one on the left, and the one on the right would, would no longer be up to date. And, and uh, that would be working in conjunction with the rest of XDCR. You can do things like pause cross data center replication, do whatever upgrade you need to do, and then resume it. And any deltas would uh, then replicate across. Um, of course, on the back end, cross data center replication is replicating that data between the different clusters, whether you're using timestamp-based conflict resolution or revision-based conflict resolution. But we've written this uh, to handle lots of different topologies. The most common topology we see is the two data center topology. Um, but if you haven't worked with cross data center replication before, when you create those replication agreements, you're actually able to do things like a one-way replication or bidirectional replication. Or we even have some deployments that are uh, advanced, uh, more advanced uh, deployments. Uh, PayPal would be one that uh, had spoken about their cross data center replication deployment before, where they have a ring topology. So they actually have four different uh, data centers that are uh, working in a ring uh, kind of topology. And so what we have in the multi-cluster awareness for Java uh, client is that ability for your application to describe what topology you're running your cross data center replication on top of and how you want that uh, layer, that MCA layer to behave in certain failure conditions. And it does that uh, built on top of a failure detector uh, that then works with a coordinator and uh, that interface uh, up to your application. So a couple things on components. There's a component called a coordinator that defines uh, when and how to fail over. By the way, the coordinator is uh, an open interface, so you can actually implement your own coordinator if maybe you have uh, more information from your environment. Uh, in some enterprise environments, you might some, have some other source of telemetry to allow you to figure out uh, when you need to uh, be able to switch over from, from one location to another. Uh, failure detectors, those are things that track the faults and send failure signals to the coordinator. So an example of that, the most simple example would be a timeout. Uh, if, uh, say, a server fails, uh, I'm sure most of you are aware, 
when systems fail, sometimes they're not nice and they don't send a TCP fin before they crash. Uh, so you don't always know. You kind of have to intuit that it's timed out because it's no longer responding. And so that'll be after a timeout period. And then the multi-cluster client, that abstracts that base SDK to multi-cluster awareness uh, functionality. And then there's a, the topology administrator component within the API that allows you to uh, directly um, affect failover and failback. Uh, so I said a whole lot there. Now let's try to do a demo. Um, so I had just enough time to plug in my ethernet before I came in here. So let's see if the network actually works. Give me one second. Don't mind that. Uh, so I'm going to go out of full screen. Um, so what I have here is um, I have conveniently. So I have two clusters. Uh, and I have cross data center replication between them. I gave this one a stronger password because I put it on the public internet. Don't do that, by the way. So in this particular case, um, I'm just using EC2 uh, for my two clusters. Each one uh, has a couple of nodes in it. Uh, and then I've created a bucket called pixels. And why I've created a bucket called pixels will be apparent in a moment. So now let's uh, get connected to one of the nodes. Uh, and so I've written a small application. It's a Spring uh, um, demo app. It uh, uses Spring Boot uh, and Spring Data. Uh, and then it uh, leverages the multi-cluster aware client underneath. Uh, and uh, so let's just go ahead and start that up, and I'll show you a little bit more about it from there. So I've run uh, the multi-cluster aware client, or a, an application that is uh, multi-cluster aware. OK. And now what we have, let me see if I can make that a little bigger. Is that good, or should I change the resolution? OK. I can, I can always do the zoom thing. Uh, so what you're, what you're seeing here up at the top is every time that application accesses uh, one of the data centers, it's going to, based on which path it uses, it's going to write a pixel to that grid up on top. And the pixel will be in red if it's uh, from the West Coast data center, and it'll be in blue if it's from the East Coast data center. So we'll be able to visually see, as we interact with this data that's being uh, replicated between the two clusters, where is my data coming from? So the behavior that we want in this particular case, um, I've uh, told the coordinator, uh, this is a coordinator per uh, JVM instance. Uh, the next version of multi-cluster awareness will probably have a cross uh, JVM coordinator. So you can actually have a set of applications switch over in conjunction with each other, but this one is per JVM. So what I've told the coordinator to do in this particular case is when it receives or when it detects a failure, so you'll have that fault detector, that eventually uh, sends enough faults up to the coordinator. The coordinator will declare failure, and then the traffic will switch over to the alternate data center. So in order to do that, got to go get logged into one of the machines. We're just going to do a simple you know, catch base server stop and just to show you what's going on. So I think that's going to be this one. Yeah, so there's the workload inside. Uh, that particular uh, bucket, not a, not a really high workload, but it can certainly handle a fair amount. So uh, while we're there, uh, pop back to the terminal. So I'm just going to stop it. And sure enough, the multi-cluster aware client detected that right away, but it's going to go through a timeout period before it decides to switch over to the alternate cluster. And if everything works correctly and the demo gods are with me, we see blue pixels popping up there on the screen. So sure enough, we're now operating off of the East Coast cluster. Uh, and the, um, the application, that Spring Boot app, didn't need to know anything different. The multi-cluster aware layer actually just knew how to switch over from one to the other. And so sure enough, uh, if I get to this quickly enough, should be able to see that historic, oops. Should be able to see that you know, there was no traffic, and now there is traffic. Um, 
There's actually a little spike of traffic there because probably what happened was we were queuing up things while we were uh, unable to talk to the local node. We didn't have a connection. And then as soon as we were uh, uh, declared failure and we went over to the alternate cluster, all that traffic went through on the alternate location. So that's one quick demonstration, but I just want to show you another way that you, that you might see this. So uh, for, in this particular case, let me bring uh, that first server back up. Oops, it'll take me. Uh, while you're bringing that back up, yep. um, because you have a two node cluster mm -hmm. and you stopped one of the nodes, yep. did that imply that that five second failover is sort of what we saw or was this a little, little different? Um, in this particular case, because the, the, we're not relying on any cluster failover at all. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, it's really we what, the, on the timeout. what the coordinator is told. And I can bring up some code in a moment. But cool. you can set it to whatever level you want in the coordinator. And uh, we intend that in most cases, say you're using timestamp-based uh, yeah. conflict resolution, and you know what the latency is between your two data centers, you can kind of align that. Yeah, you know, exactly. It's, yeah. It's a little tricky because nice. when failures occur, Failures sometimes affect a lot of things, so your latencies might go up if you have a you know a larger catastrophic kind of failure like the uh, Amazon scenario you were <laughs> referring to. Probably latencies went up as well. Absolutely, awesome. Thank you. So um, while we got that brought back up, let's go ahead and restart this app. I just want to start from a fresh state. And it's a little hard to see, but we uh, we customize the. ASCII art shows the Couchbase logo there and Spring Boot when you start up. Uh, so go back here, and I'm just going to refresh uh, the app. Um, I did One thing I didn't mention is that um, the uh, multi-cluster awareness layer uh, handles all the services. So you'll notice here in the upper right uh, of this particular user interface, I have this section where I am able to interact with that programmatic layer, that coordinator, and tell it what I want to do. Uh, so this, like I said, is a Spring Boot app. Uh, so what we've done is we've we've put a couple of the uh, different um, uh, we've we've put basically a little button there for each service, and from the coordinator you can actually control how you want those uh, services uh, to switch over from one to another. Got a question? Is that built into every Couchbase cluster when you make it, or is that something special? The uh, the service uh, switchover. Oh, that's actually happening on the client side. So that's uh, that's part of uh, the. Um, there's a separate uh, component that layers on top of the SDK, and it runs multiple SDKs underneath. So it's really a, a layer that is uh, programmatically aware of multiple clusters at the same time. Uh, you, it's a it's a jar file. It exposes the same API. At the moment, we're in kind of a controlled rollout of it, uh, but it is part of your enterprise subscription, and the reason. Yeah, well, exactly. But they, they've, uh, chances are you can take an existing application and just, you might need to change it because semantics do change a little bit. But uh, we might need to review it, which is why we go through the controlled rollout process. We don't want to be in the situation where your site goes down and you know, it was uh, this piece of software that had slightly different semantics. But for sure, you can uh, just take an existing application, put it on multi-cluster awareness, uh, probably have to consider how do you tell the coordinator to handle certain failure scenarios? And you're, you're all set to go. Uh, so it is part of the enterprise subscription if you have one already. But the coordinator's built in. Right? Coordinator's built in, yeah. Yeah, the coordinator's part of the product of Couchbase on that side. And then there is the other part that the SDK has to be able to interface with that. Is that the XDR or whatever? Cross data center replication? Yeah, so cross data center replication is already built into Couchbase server. Right. The enterprise edition has the uh, the timestamp based uh, conflict resolution and the faster uh, failover times. So uh, a hybrid logical clock for the system to be able to to deal with those kinds of situations where maybe I update a record in two locations at the same time. So just to show this um, alternate, uh, so uh, and, I'll, and then I'll show you a little bit of the code. This code is actually pretty simple. So you specify that to the coordinator when the coordinator starts. Uh, so if you had um, that four cluster uh, kind of topology, uh, we've pr been pretty comprehensive in this. Uh, you know, you might say, for example, start in um, picture ring topology four. 
It might start in the upper left, but what do you want to do in a failure case? Do you want to go to the one to the right or the one to the left? And we don't really know. That's up to you as an application developer or deployer to specify to the system. Um, and then you do uh, have uh, both, like I said, programmatic access and JMX access to be able to switch that back later. Uh, so, um, and we also handled, say, one other case, which is what happens when you get to the end? Uh, do you want to continue going around the ring if things keep failing, or do you want uh, to stop there? Uh, and the reason for that is you probably, uh, there can be certain kinds of pathological kind of failure conditions where you don't want to be ping-ponging across the cluster and uh, changing data. So um, let me hold on to questions here, and I can, uh, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'm definitely available after the session. Actually, I think I'm the only thing between you and lunch, so thank you for uh, sticking around. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, there's programmatic access. So for example, I can, uh, uh, as you see in this particular case, all of our, uh, all of our traffic's uh, occurring from one cluster. Maybe I need to do, go into a maintenance interval. And so rather than actually doing a failover, I want to uh, tell the application, I'm going to switch from one data center to another. So first I'll turn off the query service, and then the view service, and then the search service. And so we didn't have any of those workloads. Uh, technically, I could do something like this. You know, select one equals one, nothing really exciting. And then it would, al it would run to the uh, alternate cluster. Oh, it didn't show in the graph. Uh, should have shown. Yep, OK. That's the demo fail on that part. Uh, and then if I, I click binary, what we should see is it should automatically switch from one to the other. And it didn't, probably because I did the nickel thing. OK, let's, let's rescue that demo. I'm guessing I threw off the coordinator there a little bit. So as soon as it comes back up, OK. So we're operating on one, uh, and then if I uh, turn off, say, the binary, which is really KV uh, data interaction, what we should see is it's going to switch from one cluster to the other cluster because I'm telling it to switch uh, that data uh, and start directing it to the other cluster. Interesting. Well, it worked earlier. <laughs> so uh, so uh, I'm not quite, let's see. Shut down latency mentor. Um, I, I won't try to uh, debug this particular one live, but uh, what I can do is uh, probably show one other uh, scenario. And this is, so that would be a switchover, right? That's a manual sort of, I as an administrator want to take an action. The other thing that you might do is uh, do a failover itself. Uh, so uh, yeah, I can go tell Cluster West, I can tell the coordinator, I want you to fail. I, as an administrator uh, or a developer, I want to fail Cluster West, and then it should automatically, okay, now it's, now it's working with me. Um, it automatically switched over to Cluster East uh, in this uh, particular case. And if we were to look at our traffic, um, doo -doo -doo, you know, sure enough, the traffic popped up as it went from uh, one to the other, oh, and I'm logged out of that one. Um, one interesting thing here, though, is if uh, let's, should we should we attempt our nickel again? Uh, so try to run a request. Yeah. Okay. So you can see now my nickel requests are hitting cluster east as well. Uh, so not a very exciting request, but I'm able to generate a little bit of load, and that's going to cluster east as well. And if I'd switched individual services, I may do that. And that gets a little complicated because. What do you actually want to have happen in a nickel case? You know, the, that nickel query might touch multiple v-buckets, and you don't necessarily have a defined behavior, which is why we leave a little bit of that up to you. Um, if I were to, and I, I know we've got a couple questions here, if I, if I were to do a fail back, uh, because I've told my coordinator um, I don't want you to fail back when you get to the end of the list, it will refuse to fail back in this particular case. I could equally tell the coordinator I want you to fail back, just continue to go back and forth. Um, pers we kind of don't do that by default, mainly because we want to be a little careful of the ping pong effect. Uh, so let me pause there. Got a couple questions. I think you had a question. I know you're, you have one as well. Uh, so there was one in the front that I asked you to wait. Yep. Yeah, so the, um, 
uh, to repeat the question, if the coordinator is delivered as part of the jar file, does that mean it's per application instance? In the current uh, version, it is. What we have actually written into uh, the, the software for future version is that we're going to effectively cluster the coordinators and cluster it outside the context of a couch-based cluster. Because you can still have, say, multi-node failures where we don't want to rely on that cluster for that coordination. So we're looking at uh, using things like uh, etcd and so forth um, to be able to... <laughs> I think that's a sign, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, but you'll basically have a cluster of application servers. So uh, we're out of time, but I'll try to take, can I try to take yeah, the last, one, one, yeah. one last question? Yes. That was the same question. Same question, okay. So uh, yeah, so basically you'll have a cluster of clients. Uh, so I'll be around after this and be happy to give more information. Thank you very much for the time. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.